high level overview. So if anyone at all has any experience, wants to speak in, comment, whatever. I have a client based out of Durham that is doing a lot of work with artificial intelligence and recommendation engines. And they, um, we've been trying to build like a social graph of, our, of the own user base that we have and the, um, and the type of content that they might be interested in. So that led me to Neo4j. And I just have this possibility to learn something. There's no faster way to do it than that. Uh, starting with graph databases, um, graph databases, has anyone here worked with them? I mean, I know they're becoming more and more common. A graph database is like, it's a different type of database than a relational database, and it's a different way of visualizing data, but it's still the same idea that it's, you can query it, you can store information, it's, it's saved on the disk, um, they persist. Uh, Neo4j is actually capable of scaling at a very, very large scale. Uh, very common, this is their definition off of their website. But like, you know, the most common that we all know is Facebook, which is a massive graph database of its own kind. And I'll get into a little bit more of the details here. But basically, what I, the reason what I got here is I've always done, I've done this forever. This is how I, when I first sit down and start thinking about needing to build a table structure, I start drawing circles and arrows and connecting things. And, and even if, like, if this could be like a relational database that I was going to put in Postgres or something like that, but I've, I've done this for years and didn't realize that what I was really doing was designing what it basically is a graph. But I would do it and then start writing all the primary keys and the relational tables and all the associations and all that kind of stuff. So it, the minute I realized that what this all was, I was like, oh, wow, this is awesome. Um, so the way that their graph is constructed is it contains, it's made of two major parts, nodes and relationships. A node is like, Basically, you can think of node as like a single, uh, a single item of some kind, for lack of a better word, and the and then so you have two of them, and then the relationship is like the connection between those two things. So, like in Twitter world, it's like if you follow someone, you've got two individual people, and then your relationship is the follower and the following. What's awesome is that both nodes and relationships can have properties, which is basically like a schemaless key value store, so you can put anything you want in there. And you can then search by that, which is really super powerful. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, so that's kind of the basic overview of what a graph is. Can a relationship have more than two nodes in it, or is it always a relationship between? It's, it's two relationships are always, at least as far as I understand, are always between. And and also it has a direction. Yeah. So okay. Okay. There's so a it's direct to graph. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is important. That was my question. The the directional. directional. Yeah. It's totally directional. So, you know, this is more talking about the nodes. Uh, I don't know. So graph records are nodes. You know, the simplest one is just like a simple record. And like, we're going to get into NoSQL stuff in a little bit. But, you know, here's a node all the way over there that I made myself. I, my name is Jay. I live here. I love to eat pho. It's awesome, you know. And so each record is a node, and the properties are in there. It's pretty straightforward. Every node also has a label, and this is important. So, like, I would label my node as person, but you may also want to have like a car node or any other kind of like actual way of labeling something so that you know what it is. Um, yeah, because that's you'll see in just a second. I'm just getting through the quick part to get to the good stuff. Okay, relationships, as we were just saying, connect two nodes and they have a direction. So, here's an example from the actual Neo4j website where they're talking. You know, we have five different individual people, and they all know each other in different capacities, so the arrows represent you know, who knows who and whatnot. You could, you know, it would be a very common thing. You see Johan and Ian right there in the middle with the long nose arrow. You know, there's going to be a reciprocal arrow going back, so like if they know each other, there's going to be two arrows, but you might have different properties because they may think different things about each other. You know, one may like it, one of them will not. Think the other one's ridiculous or something. Quality factors of the data would fit in the parameters that would fit on the relationship. Um, and so, what you get when you start getting into all this is patterns of data, which is what I really like the most about this. Is it's just a very visual way of representing this kind of stuff. Um, here we go. Yeah, this is getting more into like the whole, um, you know, the adding attributes to the relationships, basically. Um, okay, this gets into Neo4j. 
we're doing. Before I go any further we into that next section, does, it, does that make sense so far? Does anyone have any questions? It's pretty simple. It's not like, it's, this isn't like a big complicated thing. So does it, do people have different keys and values? Like all the relationships, you don't have like 10 different keys that are always present. No, or 10 it's schema. Keys. So you can put whatever is relevant and leave out what isn't. So you don't have to predefine what a relationship makes up. You can you know custom add things as it's necessary. And it's super powerful, especially when you get into querying, because you can look for people who have certain hobbies, for example, and just find those people and ignore everything else that doesn't actually have that key inside of the attributes for the relationship. But if you want to query about the relationship, then you would want some standardization of, of the keys in those relationships. You, yeah, you would. But I think that's more of an attribute of the application or the use case than right. the actual database itself. Right. Which is cool. OK, so Neo4j, it's actually a commercially produced product, but it is open source as well. Um, I underline my two favorite parts, which are um, it's massively scalable. I mean, this thing is running. There are like, examples of this running, like huge examples. And then the other one, which we're getting ready to get into, which is my real favorite part, is the, the query language. Um, it's just gorgeous. It's absolutely really, really pretty and, and, and really easy to understand. Um, so, and it's at neo4j.org. Um, so, Cypher is the name of the query language. Um, and it was, you know, custom designed for Neo4j. It has a beautiful text art syntax. So whenever you're referencing a node, you surround it in parentheses. Whenever you're referencing a relationship, you put it in brackets and you use arrows. Like, so if you're like trying to define, like, here's a node, here's an attribute of a relationship, and here's another node, and you want to go that way, you actually put a text arrow in there. So you can actually look at it and see, and it looks like what you expect. I think that's awesome. Um, it also has uh, familiar SQL files as ordering limits, where, and that kind of stuff. And we're going to see all that here in just a second. Okay, so here's the first one. This is how you, this is, uh, I'm going to go through like the basic, these are all the basic like um, Cypher queries, just because see this so that we get, it's going to add on to it at the end. This is the basic create clause. Um, the parentheses here indicate the definition of the node. This is kind of like, it, in Ruby world, it's kind of like a symbol uh, or it's like a handle or a variable or however you want to think it. Um, this person is the label. And then the brackets here represent the hash, which fills out the attributes. So, you know, variable JS is going to have a node of the label person, might, the attributes, the name J from actual variable. So then matches the way how you find them. So this should look familiar from SQL stuff. So you want to match, oops, sorry, wrong button. Um, so you want to match, you want to find a person and you're going to assign it to this variable. And then this is where you are, that is the typo on the front, that should say JS. I messed that up. But we're basically where the attribute name equals J and then return an object. Um, so that's basically like, you know, you're just your basic find query. What it looks like in Cypher. So again, um, you know, the circle here indicates that you're assigning a node to that uh, to that variable, which I, you know, again, it's pretty cool to make visual like that. Okay, so here we're going to create some more, and we're going to create some relationships. Okay, so I put myself in there. I have a Conroy who's from Asheville, and I don't know if he does or not, but his hobby is now surfing. Um, and then we added some more people. Um, some of this stuff came. Pulled some of this stuff directly from the Neo4j website tutorial section, so you can go reference it. Each one of these is going to be assigned to this to this variable, so IR as a person type, and the EN, RVP is Rick. And then you come down here, and now we're establishing relationships. So JS, which is the node representing me, knows CW, which is Conroy, since 2014. And I know variable Ian from England, and our relationship has a rating of five. Or without attributes, it's just, you know, CW is Conroy knows, Ian Conroy knows, Allison, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. So here in this one, one query, which is executed all at once, we've built, you know, one, two, three, four, five nodes, and what is that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven relationships all inside of one. 
that make sense to the, it seems pretty straight to me I don't think any random questions so far okay we move on okay so then we get into pattern matching so this is where the, the power starts coming in so what this is what you you know what you want to find so uh, the object the node js is a person assigned it to that knows friends so what this is going to do is find um, where name is J and return the node and the friend. So basically what this is, when it query through the nodes, the relationship with the label nodes and return all the friends for a person whose name is J, basically. And so this is where you're starting to reach out further from the center node through the relationships and find the different pieces of the... And the scenario no arrow scatters is, or is that relationships in either direction? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, actually. That's correct, yeah. That would be bi-directional. So okay. either J knows them or they know J. Awesome. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You said greater than or equal to seven, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, that's in all in. And then I can now go to um, browser. I don't have time to see it. And this is interactive real-time browser that connects my local machine to the Neo4j instance running on my, on my computer. Um, so I put this in here as a note to myself. So what I'm going to do is if you run this if you run this on your local machine they've got this really cool thing called the movie draft and it will automatically this is like their standard
this query right here, match node of n, returns the whole graph. And it's now's when you can really start to see what it's doing. It's getting awesome. So that's the entire movie graph. Here's Kevin Bacon. You know, things movies he's acted in. So there's all kinds of different relationships here. Directed, starred in, you could probably use his own little special space here, acted in. So this is creating relationships between, um, um, it has nodes such as person and movie, and then it has relationship types, acted in, directed, produced, wrote, followed, and reviewed. So those are all the different types of relationships that are all mixed up inside of this one giant graph right here, which is pretty cool. Um, this thing has, I don't know how much, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time, but I, if you come and check all of this out, this movie graph will walk you through the entire process where you can find different people, different movies, movies from the 90s based on attributes, and you can really get an idea of what you can really do with, with Neo4j and graph databases in terms of data visualization. But just for the fun of it, the shortest path from Kevin Bacon to Nick Ryan is through Tom Cruise. So anyway, this is all available. It's all super open source and open source. Yeah. Did it show ties in that in that particular type of query? If there, was, if there was more than one shortest path? Uh, I think so. There's definitely like um, the query bef right before that one is uh, here's where the dot is. Uh, the, the, the thing that you were talking about. How, how m movies and actors up to four hops away. The uh, shortest path thing that you do here, that was where the distance is simply a count or number of hops. Mm -hmm. Does it have the capability to do shortest path computations based on other properties? I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure. So like if the nodes were intersections and the edges were streets, were links. Mm -hmm. I think so. Do do I, would, I would assume so. I don't know. I mean, I kind of done that for sure. Mm -hmm. But it seems like. Look at all of what what Facebook is doing. They, they published a paper fairly recently about how they're doing their graph database, and they're they've built kind of a, a, a graph layer on top of SQL databases. Mm -hmm. um, did you get it's a called Cassandra, right? Yeah. I cool. forget. I, I glanced through the paper a couple of weeks ago, and I need to go back to it. They but dropped Cassandra. It was they dropped Cassandra. Okay. They dropped it, that. it was it was incredibly cool. Um, yeah. Just. They're taking advantage of the fact that they don't re they don't need instantaneous global consistency of the database, and so they, it's an eventually consistent kind of system, um, and it gives you a lot more speed. I don't know if you had a chance to. I'm curious, that, yeah. kind of what the different properties are between the two. It's the thing I'm working on now is definitely kind of graph based, and I haven't decided which direction to go yet. So I mean, it would be hard to create intersections where you stored primary keys in attributes here or sure. in your relational database and then mm -hmm. we're able to pull backwards and forwards and you know do queries based on which where they're gonna be most efficient and, and I don't see any reason why that would you know, easily see use cases for that. I'm trying to say. Is is this the actual database or is it sitting is it a layer on top of other databases? No this is well as far as I understand this is the actual database but for this one no it isn't. Or just in general Neo4j it doesn't It's not. It's not using MySQL. No, no, no. That's right here. I guess. I guess I can open it up and we can look at it. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. It's just. It, it is flat files. It's, 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 it's,
There's a book by the guy who did Neo 4 j called Graph Database. It's just a, a, a one of my, the, the same publisher that does all the Perl books and stuff like that. Wow. Thank you, sorry. But uh, anyway, he talks about the, the actual data structure that's on disk for it. And um, you know, it's a series of files that's beyond me to understand how he has them set up, but essentially they're flat files. Wow. The keys. See if something up. blows up or not. Have you when you <laughs> use this, have server. you used this in like JRuby or how are you interacting with this programmatically? I I'm just now I mean I'm this is I got into this because I'm actually just about to start implementing this personally. Um, where the, the project we're working on, the front end is all going to be built in Rails and in uh, client JavaScript stuff. We have to take a lot of that yet. Uh, the algorithms are all being processed in Python and in Java. Java and then just come data stores in between them. So, because we're building like a family of apps that based around this one data store. So that's how we worked our way in to Neo. We're probably actually going to end up doing like a multiple data store and, and, and use Redis probably. We're still completely under it. Mm -hmm. We just got funded. That project just got funded. So that's what happened when I opened the file and <laughs> got that. But so yeah, it's cool. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, one of your early slides said that there was a Java API, but I think that there was some other library, some other language support. Uh, it had a REST API, so it's like yeah. REST API. Okay. And the REST, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to say I use this on a daily basis. Yeah, so yeah, I, I know it. But the REST API is very good for querying, but you'll need to use the Java API if you need to load significant data. Okay. Because the REST API is brutal for actually bulk loading data. Uh, and so, so. But it's good for querying? Yeah, and it's good. So what I think it was Mark who was asking about doing like the shortest path algorithm that's mm -hmm. different. So that's going to be just basically a standard Dijkstra algorithm that they're doing there. So if you want to do a custom one, then look at other properties. You have to go into the Java API and use their traversal. And you do a depth first traversal of the graph. And then use your own criteria for, for kicking out relationships that you didn't like. Uh -huh. um, but it does that one, the single one, the shortest path, will return only one shortest path. So the stock one. Yeah. But if you yeah. write your own traversal, you can. Right. Yeah. But do you know, are there other wrappers for the native API or unknown? Besides, what do you besides mean? Java? Or? Yeah. No, but in fact, the entire database is in, except for the flat files, everything that, that when you start that Neo4j, there's no Apache or anything running. It's literally like a Java. Okay. That's the web server. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything's in Java. So. Okay. Cool. Oh, it's the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was yeah. really interesting. Super interesting. That's kind of cool stuff. I can't and Jay, would you do it if you don't mind? While they setting up, I'll just tell you from the experience. Try and store as very as few things if you guys do with these databases, whether it's this graph, the for j or any of the graph data, from because I've gone through multiple iterations. Try and store as few things in those key value pairs, property pairs, as you possibly can. So the general rule that I came that I stumbled on searching on the internet was anytime you might have a more than one relationship, store it as a node not as a property. So if you say Jay from Asheville, Jeremy from Asheville, as soon as two people have Asheville, Asheville should be a node, and you should have a link that says lives in or resides in or something like that. So anytime you have more than two people sharing a property, the best thing to do is get it in a node because those, those properties are, uh, it's easier to find that node than it is to find the property in some, they have to search all nodes to get the property as opposed to just finding the one node that's named that, if that I, makes sense. I mean, that makes yeah, sense because you're talking about nouns. But you can't index? You can, you can index, uh, you, yes, you can index, and you can even do prime, it's essentially primary key, like unique indexes on a property. But it's still uh, computationally slower than just saying I have a, a location label with the name Asheville, it's going to find that immediately and then just say, I only have to do one traversal to see okay. who lives there. 